Hello and welcome. Here we are at the end of day two of the, the wrap-up of the ESC Congress. It's been amazing. There was a time that uh, cardiology thought that big breaking trials that change practice was something in the past. We've seen some really exciting studies today. So I want to introduce uh, Marco Roffi, who needs no introduction to you, Roxana Moran, and Stefan Vindica, three key experts who've helped chair sessions and interpret the data. And we're going to be talking about four studies in particular. So we thought the issue of um, the index artery was completely solved. Was it completely solved? I mean, it's been in the guidelines as a hazard uh, to do standby PCI on the other lesions if somebody comes in with an index ST elevation MI. So we now have complete a definitive large-scale trial. Tell us about this. Yes, Keith. So really, it's been an exciting uh, day. And as a chairperson of this meeting, together with Silvia Priori, really, I could not be more delighted about it. So uh, the complete study is really a groundbreaking trial with more than 4,000 patients with uh, STEMI and multivessel disease. They were randomized to a culprit-only lesion approach versus multivessel stage PCI. So we it's have multivessel stage, stage and PCI. that's critically important. This critically, and actually this is what clinically relevant, because yes. the vast majority of interventional cardiologists would not do immediate multivessel PCI, while stage multivessel PCI is one of the commonly done approach. We have to say that the guidelines give us, the European one at least, give us a 2A indication for this, but the level of uh, um, evidence was limited now complete as five times the size of the second largest study in the field. And what we have seen that the follow-up of three years, patient with a complete stage revascularization had a benefit, a 26% reduction in the events of cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. And the benefit was largely driven by a 32% reduction in myocardial infarction. If we add the prevention of ischemia-driven revascularization, the benefit is even larger with the number needed to treat of 12. So really an amazing result. So Barker, what does this tell us about where these next infarcts are coming from? So, Because the index infarct has been treated. The index infarct has been treated, but we see that over time, actually in the curve continue to diverge, right. uh, the benefit of multivessel revascularization is there. So what does this tell us is that the, the, these are events not related to the culprit lesion. Right. And, you know, let's just clarify, there have been smaller studies in the past that have, have not done staged revascularization, but have done index yes. revascularization of all vessels, and they've had some deleterious effects. Yes. So I think that this is really a an, an, uh, strategy which is uh, applied to everyday clinical practice and tells us clearly that the way to go now is multivessel stage PCI. With respect to at what time point the second procedure should be done, we don't have conclusive data, but subgroup analysis showed us that you can do it during the hospitalization, as suggested by the ESC guidelines, or you could even do it at a later point, and uh, no difference was seen in the study. Now, um, Roxana, what should we do about these other lesions? How do we know which ones to treat? So, in complete, it was really done uh, by a um, angiographic evaluation, yes. and so that was sort of one of the limitations because we know that if we really wanted to get an excellent outcome, we can do physiology-guided PCI. And of course, that was one of the limitations that everyone talked about during the um, presentation. But honestly, when you're talking about a 4,000 patient study across the globe, really, it is really, really difficult to tell them exactly what to do. Dynami did that, and they did a great job, but only 600 patients. Yeah, yeah. So I think the totality of the evidence is telling us that complete revascularization is the way to go in STEMI patients without cardiogenic shock. Yeah. 
And so that's an important take home message. And when you do it, either at the index hospital or outside, within 35 or so day, that was the median time that it occurred, is absolutely fine and it was safe and still effective. And I think, Marco, you make the most important point that the, ma the majority of the benefit was over the long term. These curves diverged. And it just is telling you that complete revascularization is really important in uh, multivessel disease and STEMI. So a physiology-guided study would be great, but I think at this point, given what we're seeing, it looks so, Great. Roxana, you, you are making a, a case for a physiology-guided study, but I would be provocative and say that some of the lesions that have caused the subsequent infarcts may not be uh, critically stenosed. Well, I mean, I think you can, you can say that, and there's no question. If you saw the subgroup analysis with a core lab evaluated greater than 80% or less than 80%, there seemed to be even a bigger benefit in those patients that had greater than 80% yep. narrowing, which makes sense. Uh, but I think, you know, the evidence is there and the, um, the data, I believe, is extremely clear with hard endpoints of death and MI reduction. Uh, I think it's phenomenal uh, when you have the numbers needed to treat at 30. Stefan. is uh, raising an important uh, point, and that is an acute coronary syndrome is a systemic disease with inflammation, probably not just in the culprit lesion, but in other vessels. And I think the open question is, is that pragmatic approach just angiography sufficient, or maybe other approaches like intracoronary imaging with OCT, uh, where we look actually at blood characteristics uh, that identify low-grade lesions, but that may be vulnerable, could be also amenable. Uh, yeah. to non so potential opportunities for research uh, in the future. But here's something um, in terms of the strategy of, of REVASC for the other lesions. Quite a wide time window. Is that too wide? What do you think, Stefan? There, there is no reason to wait uh, too long. Uh, yeah. The question is how close you can go, and uh, this comes down to a safety issue uh, that is in patients that have renal dysfunction or you have had a complicated intervention for the culprit lesion that you may abstain from this. Uh, but I think uh, the maximum inclusion was uh, 45 days. Um, and I think the interval anywhere in between, as Marco mentioned, is undefined, but there is no reason uh, 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 to, to move that as closely to the index intervention. I would like just to make a final point just to show that there was no increase in bleeding and there was no increase in renal complication. So now in a, in a, in a trial with more than 80% of the patient treated by transradial approach, having a, a stage procedure is, is safe. It is safe. And, um, you know, in terms of the, um, the outcomes, these were measured uh, in a very well-conducted study. Uh, the loss of follow-up was incredibly small. So there is security in this information. Roxana, is this going to change practice? Well, I think so, but I'm a little biased. <clears throat> I was on the executive committee. <laughs> I do believe it's going to, it, it is absolute. I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's going to change practice, but it might change guidelines yeah. because I think the practice as it is now is that you want to do complete revascularization. So, so one of your enthusiastic you colleagues comes to you, Roxana, after you get back from the Congress and says, well, I don't want to wait for stage. I want to do this at the same time. Well, I, I, I also think that, uh, you know, we didn't test that. In, That's in not complete. been tested. Uh, and Prammy did do that. Uh, it was at the time and in, uh, in the in the same uh, uh, and culprits did uh, did either way. Yeah. So I mean, I think the totality of the evidence is saying go for it, forward for a complete revascularization. The timing of it could be done in hospital or staged uh, outside at the same time. I don't. You know, it depends on the safety for the patient. So I would say that this support practice, I'm sure that Stefan is doing already this, 
that Roxana is already yes. doing this. So I would say that this trial supports current practice. Yes. Okay. I, I just would add, we do know that if we compare patients with acute MI who have single vessel disease as compared to multi-vessel disease, the highest risk of recurrence is during the 30 days disadvantaging the patients with multi-vessel disease. So I think the consideration to the time interval is an important one and it should be shorter than 30 days. So let, let's come now, and you won't say this because you're on the executive committee, but I can say that not only will it support practice in centers that have been you know, highly innovative thinking centers, but it's going to support practice elsewhere. I think it's really important. So let's come to Themis. Themis much awaited the uh, prior announcement that the trial met its primary endpoint, about a 10% risk reduction in the endpoint, was significant. 19,000 patients with diabetes. Uh, what's the interpretation? Who would like to start on Themis? So Themis is a 19,000 patient, uh, patients with stable coronary disease who um, are diabetics. So it's an important, it's a high ischemic Elevated burden. Risk. It's high ischemic burden patients, right? Elevated risk. Uh, I must say they met the primary endpoint, but I was somewhat underwhelmed because the absolute reduction of 1% risk of the ischemic, composite ischemic, was met with a 2% increase, absolute increase of bleeding, um, which was significant. Uh, and uh, not, it wasn't fatal bleeding, but there was some increased, even rare, intracranial hemorrhage. So I would be cautious. So I was, I always felt that then there was this evaluation of the prior PCI, history of prior PCI, and then there the net clinical benefits seem to work. I, I always caution people when, when these things occur. It's nice to find where do you gain the most benefit, but I must say that um, I'm not so sure that I was completely overwhelmed and um, this didn't raise me to get up so and applaud. So in fairness to the investigators, they pre-specified the, the, the prior PCI group and it, it appears that there is a much stronger signal. In fact, when you look at net clinical benefit in the remainder, it was neutral. Mm -hmm. It was neutral. I, I, I would argue that actually in the subgroup, uh, there is no, not a preferential benefit from Ticaglor because the, in the, there was not a statistically significant interaction with respect to the primary point. So, and then there is the issue of the composite net endpoint, there there was a statistically significant interaction, but uh, although this was uh, pre-specified, it was, uh, I would say, in my perspective, somehow unusual uh, to have uh, death MI and then to have intracranial hemorrhage or fatal hemorrhage, because if we take a, a net clinical benefit as commonly defined, uh, including major bleeding instead of intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding then the numbers would have looked much different and yeah. the benefit would have been reduced. Stefan, what do you think? I, I think from a patient physician perspective, it's difficult to uh, add this medication in a stable patient that has not had a recent procedure. But I think the discussion is different. If you have had a PCI, the patient uh, comes after six months or a year and the question is, whether to extend the treatment or, or not. And I think there are two considerations take place. One is uh, whether you would de-escalate the treatment from the 90 milligram BID dose to 60 milligram BID dose. And I think another consideration uh, is uh, what uh, Roxana is uh, testing, whether you actually could leave out one antiplatelet therapy to mitigate uh, the adverse uh, risk of uh, bleeding while maintaining the advantage in terms of ischemic events. So the, the presenters were very clear. Yes, there is this benefit, but there is also the bleeding hazard, and it includes major bleeding, and about a 23 to 2.5 fold increase in ICH, although the rates were very low. So in terms of impact on care for the patient who's had, you know, prior, clearly got diabetes, there's now a bucket of treatments for this patient. Is, is the Themis regimen going to be among those in the bucket for those with a prior PCI? 
So, you know, there was a couple of things about these diabetic patients. But only about 2% were on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, the, the, the time of prior PCI was the median of 3.5 years before the time of randomization. So it wasn't a recent PCI that was done so that you could even make that. And then this comes in the middle of the COMPASS study that was presented um, a couple of years ago with a really, really significant reduction in mortality and a reduction in PAD-related events. Uh, of course, this is not all diabetic patients. So I, in my mind, I feel like in these diabetic patients um, with cor a coronary disease, perhaps an alternative pathway going towards the SGLT2 inhibitors is more smart than pushing and, and the envelope. And profound lipid lowering. And profound lipid lowering PCSK9 inhibitors yeah. is, is more interesting to me but, of course, um, it's to be determined. So let's move on to um, the wonderful, exciting area of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, a really challenging area. Uh, a number of trials have tackled this and have not succeeded. Uh, Paragon HF. Paragon HF. What does it tell us? So heart failure, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to talk about this because I'm very passionate about this <laughs> because it's, uh, it's an important disease in women. It is underdiagnosed. Yes. And the treatment, um, we're undertreating patients with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure. And I think that we need an answer. Yeah. So here, over 4,000 patients were randomized to Entresto. I'll say Entresto because I just can't, sorry, I apologize. I just can't give that old big long name uh, for, the, for the drug. Certainly, uh, the treatment, I, you know, and they missed the primary endpoint. They just barely missed the primary endpoint. And so then you start to think, oh, no, what, what, what do we do here? But within was, this population, there's actually a spectrum of LV dysfunction just below that's right. the threshold. Where so it they says saw something quite benefit. interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, I was impressed that Stuart Connolly, who was the commentator, who's, who's really strict in his rules with a negative trial, yeah. the subgroups should be hypothesis generating only. They really are not uh, that, infor they're informative at best. Um, but he was very excited actually to say that, look, you know, in this patient population with uh, just lowered ejection fraction, not completely low, but in the gradient of the lower EF, in this preserved EF group, there was a benefit. And then I was excited to see that women actually benefited. And this, the, 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 the point estimate was absolutely for benefit. So I would say we need to think about a all-female HEF, so HEF Roxana, PEF study. So Roxana, you drive this. Yeah, Do I, I don't know, but I'm not, a, I mean, I, this is a heart failure okay. trial, but I'm, hoping that our heart failure okay, colleagues so will take that on. Sadly, overall, that did not uh, meet significance. Let's move on to DAPR-HF. DAPR-HF has had a huge impact today. Who would like to start summarizing? Stefan, do you want, to, were you in the session with DAPR-HF? Yes, so I think first we need to acknowledge that the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, have prominence uh, in the new set of uh, the diabetes uh, guidelines and uh, by the presenters of the guidelines it actually was mentioned that the new drugs, uh, the GLP-1 receptor antagonist uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, should be classified uh, as the most important event in diabetic patients since the advent of insulin in yeah. 1924. And I think that gives us a nice perspective how to look at these uh, new uh, drugs. Now I think uh, we have and, seen... And, and if I can interrupt, and not to look at these drugs as glucose lowering, Cor but as key cardiovascular endpoint drugs. Yes, so I, I think there's really a paradigm shift where drugs uh, used uh, to lower glucose were not only safe, but actually in terms of efficacy for cardiovascular outcomes were superior for maize and for some of the agents even for uh, cardiovascular mortality. And I think uh, in that context, uh, this trial is important because now we have an extension so to- So just summarize the, the outline of the trial. 
So basically, it was now an extension to heart failure patients with reduced uh, ejection uh, fraction that included both uh, diabetic and non-diabetic uh, uh, patients. And they were randomly assigned to a standard treatment of uh, heart failure or to the uh, and placebo or to dapaflicosine. And uh, the outcome was such uh, that uh, for the uh, uh, composite maze endpoint, there was a major difference in favor of uh, dapagliflozin. I remember and about a 26% risk reduction relative, in the primary, relative, relative uh, risk, risk reduction in the primary endpoint. But importantly, there was also a difference uh, in uh, cardiovascular uh, mortality. Indeed. So I think what you alluded to is uh, these drugs uh, that we just got used to, perhaps in a diabetic population, uh, they seem to work uh, also as a major agent on top of all the established uh, therapies, that is uh, beta blockers, uh, mineral corticoid receptor yeah, antagonists, yeah. and uh, more recent sacopitril. So, so absolutely critical that we don't think in silos, because here's an overlap with diabetes and cardiovascular outcomes. We've got to think about reducing these vascular events. Marco. Yeah, actually, I, I think it's, it's amazing to see that the, the degree of benefit uh, was uh, very much similar in patients with or without diabetes. And actually also in patients with or without sacubitril valsartan on board. Yes. So this really seems to have, have a benefit across the border independently of uh, uh, diabetes status. So, uh, I... so what I'm excited about is thinking outside of the box for heart failure patients. And I think we need to start thinking like this for our patients after PCI, et cetera, for alternative pathways. Yes. Where uh, I, I tried to, I was sitting next to uh, Dr. Solomon, Scott, and I said, what, do you think, is it a diuretic? Do you think it's a diuretic? <laughs> he said, this might be a smart diuretic. Smart diuretic. And that there may very well be, and, and, and I think we also spoke, um, uh, Stefan and I were having a, a little bit of a discussion, and he was talking about the sodium, uh, yeah. uh, uh, serum sodium concentrations. And I think these are really interesting, the, and, and it makes us excited about cardiovascular disease but, and that how important it is for all of us across the subspecialties to talk to each other and think about these alternative strategies for different things that we are thinking. So I want to finish by asking each of you one study that you would pick out as impacting on practice. Marco. But I think, uh, can I have two? No, you can no. have one. So, DAPA HF. And if you had two, it would be? Complete. OK. What's of that? these four. Of these four. DAPA HF, and, and of course, complete, but <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, I go with Marco's choice, the two, and it's really the synergistic approach of intervention, mechanical treatments, and drugs. So a huge thanks to all three of you for your insights, because this has been a really exciting day. Uh, please think about these, read the original publications um, for those that are out already, and uh, enjoy tomorrow. We have a great, exciting Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.